Hello adventurers and welcome back to the Red Quills. My name is Ryan and today I'll be taking you through how to draw a location or site specific map for your fantasy role playing game or novel. In this video I'll be drawing the map that is in front of us now, which is a map of the Still Beating Heart, a series of tunnels stretching underneath the city of Etich around a spire of rock. As I go through, I'm going to talk about my methods in drawing such a map, I'm going to give you the tips and tricks that I use to sketch out my plans and blueprints, and I'm going to help you to elevate your world building. I'll also give you some drawing tips that I use and have come across so that you can add the illustrations like mine into your own creations. Now this video also goes with the short series releasing this week in uh, site specific maps in fantasy worlds. Check it out if you want more information or help. As always, if you do like this video, please leave a comment below or share it with your friends. Now this map is obviously very different to the standard fantasy map that I tend to draw. If you've seen my videos before, it's not a realm or world map, it contains much more illustration and it's a vertical map rather than a horizontal map. All of these differences make a unique and eye-catching map. I'm quite proud of this one and it's something that I can help you with too. So what I'm going to do for this video is outline the four major processes that I've used for this map and also talk about applying these to other kinds of locations and sites for the rest of your world. Now the steps that I've taken in this map are different from the usual map that I draw. If you watch them before, you'll know that I tend to be pretty loosey-goosey about things like continental shapes and name generation. I'll generally just make things up as I go along because that works for my creative process. And I also generally only allow myself up to about seven hours total for one of these maps, including rendering. But this map, requires much more planning. Buildings and complexes tend to be planned. We can't all be town planners and architects, and sites like this have a lot of detail put into them as they're built that we may not think of as we're drawing. So the first step is sketching. In my case, I use a pacer to sketch out the borders, the compass, rows, and the legend first, and then get started on the map itself. What I will do to give everyone a couple of examples of maps that they can draw is have the main vertical map an overview of the site and the city map. So I'll put the other two boxes into the right and I'll make a loose grid with some ruled lines to make sure that everything stays relatively straight as I'm inking. Then we come into the content of it. The first thing I'm going to sketch is the focus of the complex itself, which is the heart. In my case, this is for my Dungeons & Dragons campaign, so I, I know what I'm making. But anyone who follows me and watches my videos regularly knows how much of a fan I am of the Titanic Elder Being trope. So in this case, I'm literally going to sketch a rough heart impaled on a spike of polished stone, and the tunnels will be the excavation efforts to reach it. But then it's time for practicality questions. Whenever you're drawing a layout, there's an element of practicality that you need to be ready to address. Generally, if you use the floor plan or the blueprint of any existing building or complex, you, you should if you can. But I won't, because I enjoy suffering. In this case, a vertical plan has the major practicality concern of getting from the top to the bottom, especially in the case of a mine, because they'll have a lot of heavy equipment and refuse and they'll need to move it around somehow. So as I go through, I'm going to put in some ladders and thin passages, yes, but I will also sketch out the rough locations of the lifts, some carts and pulleys, and make the tunnels wide and high enough for carts. Uh, speaking of, this is a great time to talk about sketching mines. They come up a lot in role-playing fantasy games. There's always something that you need to go into a mine to find. So mines and delves are a large part of fantasy lore. They hold a significant place in cultural development. The use of precious metals or iron is extremely important for societies, but, but they are dark and dangerous places. So here are some kinds of mine layouts to help you to design yours. Uh, because the first is the underground mine, which is like this one. They're more expensive and they're often used to reach deeper deposits. They are the tunnel mines that we think of when we picture mines. They use beams and scaffolds to help support the tunnel ceiling. And they often require, and this is important, air pumps for the workers to breathe on the lower levels. It's never thought of enough. I might make an entire video about breathing in mines and how to sketch them out. But in an extensive mine, you're going to need some way to move the air around. In our case, that is done by the heart itself, which is literally a pump. 
The second kind of mine is a surface mine. They're typically used for more shallow, less valuable deposits. These are open air mines, which are large pits carved into the earth. Carts can drive into and out of the gates of the surface. And you can see in this case, in this map, the uppermost layer of the excavation is being dug out as a pit to allow more and more access. It's not finished yet. Obviously, access on the lower levels is still difficult for carts, but uh, you can see that they are attempting to make it more and more open reveal more and more. The next kind of mine is a placer mine, which is used to sift out valuable metals from sediments in river channels, beach sands, other environments. They use meshes and grids in moving water to catch the sediment and remove the metal. I don't have an example of that in this sketch, but it's a really great kind of mine. It's very different for you. If you want to spice things up, it just requires a river or the tides of these moving water. The last kind of mining is in situ mining, which is more modern. It involves dissolving mineral resource in place and then processing it at the surface without moving rock from the ground. It's less common from the others. It creates fumes. It often requires a chemical plant nearby, but if you're running a steampunk campaign or if you're writing in a steampunk environment, then that's a much more modern kind of, of mining. So as you can see, I've started inking this now, thanks to the sh sketch in the beginning. This part goes relatively quickly until I need to shade and detail. So what I'm gonna do is use a simple outline on things that aren't specifically relevant to this map and then only properly draw the parts of the map that are. Now my drawing tips for you are the same as in my last video. You use a thicker pen on the outside, a thinner pen on the interior shapes, and then the thinnest pen for the shading. I've used a 0.4 millimeter black fine liner for the outside, a 0.1 millimeter for the interior designs like uh, windows or crags and stalactites, and a 0.05 millimeter for the shading. Now it's very time consuming, but it looks so good. If you have a location that you want to remember that's gonna go down in the history of your world, I really would recommend doing something like this. I also wanna take a moment to talk about shading. For this map, I've mainly used pontillism or stippling, which is art speak for lots of little dots. It's a pretty simple concept. The closer the dots are together, the darker the area. The benefit of it for maps like this and the sketches like the ones I use for my maps is that it gives the impression of imperfections seen from a distance. Of the shading methods that I use, it's the best to make your buildings, to make rocks, to make forests seem more real. I also use hatching, which is straight lines, and it's better for tiled or metallic surfaces. I use that on roofs mainly in this map, uh, but it is a little harder to get your lines looking as perfect as they can be for a building, so keep that in mind, it's more advanced. Now this map is focused on the cathedral, the spire, and the tunnels below, so there's a lot of detail that's going into them. Normally, I recommend labeling before you add the details to stop your map from being crowded, but for this map, I'm gonna do it the other way around. There's a lot of blank space around the chambers below, and my main priority for this is to make it feel real. Now while I'm adding these sketches, and I wanna talk about the other buildings that you can sketch. I have a cathedral here. There's gonna be some old cult buildings beneath, but fantasy antics, fantics, if you will, can take place anywhere. You need to be prepared. There are a whole host of buildings that come under the banner of cultural buildings, and I've made many maps for them, for, for writings, for gameplay. But, you know, whether they're universities, the colleges, palaces, and regions, libraries, they tend to follow the same basic guidelines. So I'm going to give you a short list of cultural buildings that you can add to your cities, and the main points for each. Uh, the first is universities. Um, they're always built on grounds by rich benefactors or councils. They have extensive estates. They tend to gain money by gathering resources or land and lending them out. Universities and colleges always have three distinct population groups. They have workers, students, and scholars. Each will need somewhere on the grounds to eat and sleep away from the others. They tend to have several entrances, but they employ private security to repel unwanted interlopers. They also tend to have curfews in effect. 
the central oldest buildings of the universities, any complex that deals with knowledge gaining, government complexes fall under this category, the oldest buildings in the center will contain the most prestigious facilities, which is generally for universities, the library and the bursary. Centers of learning also generally have a strict pecking order of social rank based on a scholar or a student subject, so that's worth remembering. Uh, the next kind of cultural building is an arena. They obviously require a large open area in the center, the audience around it for viewing, but they're also primarily a business, and if you're designing them, uh, they'll have extensive backstage areas for competitors, equipments, or animal control. Blood sports will also have sand brought in to soak up um, the, the bodily fluids, and they'll need a sand store nearby. They'll also need a main office to hold all the ticket money. Their entrances will be heavily monitored by, by bouncers and ticket sellers. The audience areas will have food vendors, water vendors, and shade for comfort. These are the kind of details that we're talking about when you're designing a cultural building. The next kind of building I'll talk about is uh, palaces, which are beautiful, sprawling buildings or complexes. They boast the best art, the, the most awe-inspiring architecture, and the greatest value of any building around. It's a separate entry for uh, castles, which I'll talk about later, because castles are meant to repel people and palaces are meant to invite. A palace is as much a cultural hub as it is a dwelling for the powerful. It will have several wings dedicated to different functions and it'll employ hundreds of workers to maintain and power it. So here are some ideas for contents for the palace which is also relevant for designing dungeons like this. Different areas will have different functions. So you can have an entertaining wing, which contains guest rooms, dining halls, meeting rooms. It can also contain private libraries and any museum artifacts. Festival wings contain ballrooms, festival courtyards, change and makeup rooms, palace wardrobes, costumiers, and instruments. The audience wing contains grand chambers, throne rooms, audience and chambers, meeting rooms, war rooms, and offices. The servant's room contains the living spaces for the workers, the kitchens and the pantries, the garden sheds and the stores. And the crown wing finally contains the residential areas for the nobility residing there. There's one last kind of building I'll talk about quickly before we move on, which is um, banks and prisons. These two are under the same heading for a specific reason. And, and the heading could also contain things like libraries, museums, galleries, arcades. They all contain gathered stores of high value items and are devoted to the care and recording of these items. Banks are often thought of when it comes to high security buildings, but that's a simple measure of reputation. A museum or a gallery contains items of a similar value. The difference is that a bank or a prison does not invite the public to view their contents. The idea of public access libraries and museums is not a universal one. Much like banks, they may well choose to only allow the powerful and wealthy within their walls and charge for the service of keeping items safe. Uh, they'll have monitored entrances for their visitors as well as a worker's entrance, ticket holders at the first, supervisor at the second, they ensure that no one leaves with any valuables. The interior is patrolled regularly and generally designed for ease of monitoring. A central area with wings extending outwards maximizes visibility. And I'm referencing this now because I have a cathedral at the top, and that roughly falls under the same category. If you have a cathedral that contains items of high value, such as tapestries or gold-plated plates. It will follow the same rules. So the cathedral above, which was once a place of worship and obviously contains high value items, will have one main entrance for the public which will be monitored when the building is open and a servant's entrance at the back, uh, which very few people have access to, generally only the highly trusted. So it makes a perfect entrance for this complex, which is high security and monitored by the army. So they will have made the cathedral the in and out of the mine. We're starting to get the shape of the map now, and I'm sure that you can see that it's taking a long time. Don't be too worried about your own. Don't be too intimidated. I have the same time frame for this map 
as I do for all of the others that I draw, and that includes the sketching beforehand. Normally, my time is generally taken up at the tree and terrain stage, but in this case, it's just the detailing of the chambers. And once that's done, I'll turn my attention to the boxes on the right-hand side of the map. On the bottom, I'll make an overview of the cathedral and the surrounds, and on the top, I'll do a city view. Now, both of these will be fairly quick drawings because my main focus is on the vertical map, but then I'll talk quickly about sketching the castles and defenses and then about doing city maps. For the lower sketch, the excavation of the cathedral is being run by the Imperial Army and they want to secure the site, so they'll erect a wall around it and try to ensure that it remains under guard at all times, no unwanted visitors. So in this way, I'll need to think about the defenses as a temporary castle. Castles, forts, baileys, they all have a specific function. They're generally planned from the ground up, but there may be a new wing or wall or tower added every few decades. They have one overriding purpose, defense, and at this, they excel. So there's four questions to really help you plan out your castles and add some details to it. So the first question is, do they expect, do they invite visitors? If a castle is home to the nobility, then they'll need somewhere to receive visitors. If it's a military outpost, it's not as much of a concern. But a fortification will generally have a central location, a large open space in which to gather those within it for muster or morale. It could be a great hall, it could be a large courtyard, or, or both. If the castle expects visitors, it will need to have an entrance hall where visitors can be received or searched. It will have an audience chamber or a great hall for feasts or ceremonies, and it will have guest rooms. The second question is where do their supplies come from? The best defences have farms and food beds within the walls and a large store of grain or flour for long sieges. Without question, a castle needs a source of water, generally a well or a spring turned into a fountain. If they don't have water, they won't be able to withstand a siege. If they grow everything for themselves, they'll need a dedicated group of farmers who'll need shelter, amenities and grounds large enough to feed everyone. If they've brought it in, they'll have a supply gate, large enough for a laden cart with an outer gate and an inner gate so that the cart can be searched as it enters. In this case, the fortifications aren't large enough to grow your own food, and they aren't expecting visitors. They have two gates on the fortifications around the cathedral, one to the west and one to the east, and they're large enough for carts to come through with supplies. They expect one per day, and they are monitored as they enter. So, the third question is, what are they defending against? A castle built to withstand an army has much more intense requirements than a mot designed to repel bandits, but the more extensive the build, the more expensive the build. The extra cost of a massive fortification can't be justified without good reason, but once it's built, it can stand for centuries, millennia, with maintenance. The level of threat that they were built to repel will determine the level of detail that they will have gone to in securing the site. So here are some ideas to increase security. You can have towers on the corners and increasing in height towards the center to eliminate blind spots. You can have concentric walls with outer courtyards, inner courtyards, and keep. You can have double gated entrances and exits. You can have grid covered wells and chimneys. You can have moats and drawbridges. You can have granaries and stores for long sieges. And you can have ballistas and oil reserves for repelling. Now we're going to head up to the sketch of the city. I tend to use two colours for these, maybe three for rivers and seas, but I have a simple irregular block pattern that I use for my own map. It involves sketching out a very quick irregular spider web of roads that you can use to then make the districts and blocks of your town. They focus on squares and important landmarks. Because towns are not like castles, they're not built and generally they aren't planned, they're grown. So the decision to make a town isn't made by one person, it's made by hundreds, thousands, over decades. They are organic creatures and they follow certain norms. Whether you're only in town to infiltrate a criminal organization's hideout, whether your entire adventure is spent within a city's walls, a town always follows these three rules. Rule number one, there must be water. It can be a river, it can be a spring, it can be a well, but if a city is large enough to be interesting, it needs to have water enough for its citizens. Now this might not seem like the most relevant fact for someone creating a fantasy world, you are a town planner after all, 
but remembering this rule will give you more angles to consider, more corners to explore. What does the drainage look like beneath the city? Does the river run through the main keep of the town? What secret things or hidden ways could hide by the running water? These are questions for you when you're designing your town. Rule number two, there will always be a division of space, no matter what. Unless it is the most squalid place in the universe, a town will always keep its industry away from its living spaces. The rich will live away from the poor. The docks, the animal pens, the processing plants, the foundries, they all stink to high heaven. The shops and the artisans will gravitate to roads and highways. So the different districts are industrial which contains docks, forges, tanneries, slaughterhouses. They're always kept away from living quarters, though beggars and thieves will hide there to avoid scrutiny. Commercial areas, which are shops, stores, crafters, they're generally mixed into the lower class residential areas where they are mixed. The shops are on the ground floor and the living quarters are above. You've got cultural areas, inns, arenas, libraries, theaters. They're mixed into the middle class areas. They're on high roads and gates. They generally take up a whole block and don't share immediate space with private dwellings and if you've got the residential areas, which is apartments, shared dwellings, townhouses, estates, and manors. Lower and middle classes are mixed in with other districts, but the upper classes will have areas to themselves. The third rule of any town is that they grow and they shrink over time. This one is an important one to remember when you're sketching things out, because as people move away or towards cities, their borders will breathe go in and out, they're going to flow with time. From the oldest core of the city to the newest outskirts, the age will determine what the buildings are like and who lives where. A town will only very rarely fit into the wall that's erected around it. The wall will enclose the older, more prestigious parts such as the town hall or the landmarks, but the new areas will spill outwards if there's not enough space. This means that a city is never as well defended as it should be. The gates have to always be open to allow the outer districts to come and go from work in the interior and much of the population will not have walls to protect them from invasion. But settlements can also shrink over time. Areas less desirable will become abandoned, a hive for criminal activity or squatters. Now I'm going to go through and label everything. I have all these chambers and many of them are filled with details already so that I have some idea about what they are and what function they serve. great time to talk about populating your dungeons. The humble dungeon is the staple of role-playing games and fantasy epics. They're sprawling underground temples, they're ancient complexes buried by lava flows, they're dark burrows extending into the earth. When you're creating a dungeon, it can be difficult to come up with ideas to fill your chambers. So here are five kinds of chamber for your dungeon. The first is an ambient chamber, which is introductory or informative. There are no threats. Your characters have a moment of peace and quiet. Perhaps some books on dusty shelves or carvings on the wall illuminate some history. The second kind is environmental danger chambers. Crumbling ceilings, poisonous fungi, choking fumes fill this room. The danger can be visible or hidden, but it provides an obstacle for your heroes without active attack. Third is a puzzle room, a maze, a riddle or a trap. Waylays your quest, your protagonist. There can be a danger in answering wrong or in taking too long. The fourth is a dead end chamber, which is a wrong turn, a bad feeling or doubling back by mistakes. These are all problems to have in dark tunnels when you're beneath the earth. The final kind is a conflict room, which is when you finally come across the inhabitants of a dungeon and it's not friendly. Blades, flash, teeth, shine in the dark. These are your obstacles, your encounters in your dungeons. All right, we're just about done here. So I'm gonna quickly summarize what we've talked about in this video so that you can use it for your maps in the future. So this is our sp site specific map, the still beating heart. As you can see, I've got uh, three different kinds of map here. The first is a hyper-realistic uh, building sketch on the top. The second is the vertical map underneath it of the mine and excavation around the still beating heart. The third is the uh, overview of the fortifications around the cathedral. And the fourth is the town map. There are 
four different stages when you're sketching a site-specific map. The first is the pencil sketch to begin with, in which you get the general shapes. The second is uh, ensuring that you've got your outlines done. That's the second part, linking the outlines. The third is the detailing. So in my case, it's the shading and the equipment. And the fourth is the labeling. Do it in that order and you won't have any problems. I've gone quickly over the different kinds of buildings that you can make site-specific maps for in your fantasy world, as well as some tips that I have given you for, for making those as practical as possible and as immersive as possible. I'm just going to finish this map up now and when I'm done what I'm going to do is I'm going to render it and then upload it to my website. The link is going to be in the description below as along with a list of the tools that I've used here and the notes that I will put on the different kinds of fancy builds you can do as well. If you enjoyed this uh, give the short series a watch. I'm going to do specific videos on each of the kinds of cultural buildings that you can sketch. And I'm going to say thank you to all of my followers. I hope that this is a helpful tutorial for you. If you want any more specific step-by-step -step instructions, if you want me to focus on something for a specific video, please comment it below. I'm very happy to make videos, put them into the schedule that I've currently got going on. I'm going to be coming out with a new video each week, as you can see if you've been following my channel. They're getting better and better in terms of quality and content. So stick around, see what I'm going to make next week uh, as we focus on some more different kinds of maps and more tips and tricks for you to elevate your world building. Thanks for watching.